Everyone has a household appliance in their home, but can the life cycles of washing machines, fridges and ovens be environmentally friendly? We find out on Sustainable Future. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Tanya Breyer and on this episode, I speak to Hakan Berkelu, the CEO of Archlik, the Turkish white goods company. Sustainability is at the core of Archlik's business. As one of Europe's largest white goods company and owner of brands like Beko and Grundig, its household appliances are designed around green targets aimed at reducing carbon emissions and increasing recycling efforts. Established in 1955, the company is headquartered in Turkey, where it manufactured the country's first washing machine. Thanks to its sustainability efforts, Archlick has been recognized as an industry leader on the Dow Jones Sustainability Index. Its CEO, Hakan Fergulu, took the helm in 2015. He's also a member of the World Economic Forum CEO Climate Leaders Alliance in support of the Paris Climate Agreement. So how did a white goods company come to prioritize sustainability? I sat down with its CEO, Hakan Bergelou, in London. Hakan, thank you so much for joining me today. It's great to see you. Thank you for having me. Of course, you're the CEO of Archelic, and prior to that, you were working for Koch Holdings. How has the business attitude changed towards sustainability since you began in the businesses? I think the whole world's attitude has uh, shifted, not only the business world, uh, but governments, individuals. I think there's a whole new level of consciousness around the planet. It essentially comes from our instinct to survive. The same I can say about our business, but the transformation has been much quicker because we also saw it as a business opportunity. Uh, doing the right thing by the environment, which means trying to mitigate the impact of a changing climate, especially uh, controlling emissions, decarbonizing, and trying to protect the ecosystem you operate in became a priority for us because we simply saw it as an opportunity to also differentiate vis-a-vis -vis our competitor set. I would say being part of a family-owned group like the Koch Group has helped because it means there's a lot more long-term vision uh, built in and effectively that long-term performance is only possible if you are doing the right thing and you're a sustainable business in terms of the environment. What are the consequences if we don't do enough to combat the climate crisis? Catastrophic. We came right to the heart of uh, what I'm very passionate about. Um, the data I have been seeing for a long time now, and uh, this started uh, when I first became CEO, I think 2015-16, when I was uh, part of the World Bank High Commission for Carbon Pricing. Uh, there I saw for the first time real, unadulterated, uh, not subjective data, objective data, and the rate of change is actually much faster than we realize. Most people talk about 2030 as this magical date uh, which by everyone will keep their promises and will decarbonize and things will be good. But when you think of 2030, for some reason, we all think it's very far away in the distant future. That immediately impacts our behavior today. We don't feel the immediate urgency or need to change our consumption habits. It's going to not only impact our children's lives, it's actually our generation which will be impacted. So uh, basically it has to be all out and the time devoted to raising awareness is over. I've done a lot of that. It's now time to take action on every level, personal, business, government, every level. Archlick produces white goods like washing machines and refrigerators. Can these be sustainable? Uh, it's a good question. I mean, ultimately, they consume energy. They use a lot of materials in production, so they cause a huge amount of emissions. Um, I do believe they can be sustainable. First of all, they have a real use case. They make people's lives easier, hygiene, food security. We can't really live without them. Uh, but what we can do is make them in a way that consumes a lot less energy. We can make them recyclable. And actually it does all of these things. And if this war, as I call it, because it is war, is going to be won, it's going to be won by companies that set these examples, that are decarbonizing, not because they have to, because of regulation, because they choose to. And uh, the scale companies, 
in the case of Archidik, reducing our emissions by 50% means 11.5 million tons, which is roughly equivalent to Hungary's annual emissions. So you can see how, if you put 100 of these companies together, how it will make a real dent in decarbonizing uh, the economy. And according to ethicalconsumer.org, the average life cycle of a washing machine, for example, has dropped from 10 years to seven. How is Archlick addressing this? This is an area which is uh, not only confusing, but quite controversial. I would want to replace every washing machine out there, not because I want to sell new washing machines, but because newer washing mach machines consume far less energy and therefore emit far less carbon and consume far less water. So I would almost argue that we need a shorter lifespan in the immediate future to reduce the amount of emissions caused by the washing machines that people use. But then the newer ones we are putting in the market should of course be durable and recyclable. How Archidic approaches this problem? We started organizing campaigns where it would give you a discount to take your old machine from you and to give you a higher energy rated machine that consumes less and give you a discount to incentivize you to buy it. But we quickly found that the older machines were ending up in the landfill and there's a huge amount of plastic, steel, copper that's really usable. We couldn't find anyone to recycle and bring these materials back into the economy. So we built our own recycle uh, link facilities. They're Mad Max looking sort of 40, 50 meter high roof, you know, giant machines. But they recover more than 90% of the materials and we use those in, in our new products or we sell it to downstream industries. You first took part in the EU's cyclical economy project, Sea Surveys, back in 2019. How feasible is total recycling to achieve a circular economy that, of course, many are hoping for? I mean, it's the holy grail. It's the whole thing about regeneration. I wish us humans could live in harmony with nature and give back at least what we take or more so that humanity is sustainable. Uh, unfortunately, this is not the world we live in. And I blame economists' forefathers and how they taught economists. I studied economics. I blame them more than others do because there's no value to nature. In any market economy, when you consume something and it gets less in quantity, it's supply and demand. The cost of that should go up. But because we don't attribute any value to nature, the cost, the opportunity cost of destroying it is not built in. I am hoping that by introducing mechanisms like carbon pricing and ETFs uh, on a global scale with the infrastructure, the cost of any material or any detrimental activity to the environment will be added to any product or service, making it more expensive and channeling the funds into preserving uh, the rest. I think it's the only way in today's world we can really reach harmony. And I would absolutely aim for an economy where we recycle absolutely everything. What more would you like to see governments do though? The governments need to regulate uh, and you know businessmen usually talk about uh, regulation as a bad thing you know the, there's usually a knee-jerk reaction of no. Uh, this is a case where regulation is a must and it has to be very aggressive because we can't leave it to the market to determine the pace of change. Up next, strengthening bold commitments. You're basically asking me questions that are uh, uh, controversial let's say but I love answering them. We have to set the bar so high that it may scare us, but really attack it in a way that will make a difference. We'll have more when we return. Welcome back to the show. I'm Tanya Breyer and I'm speaking with Hakan Berkulu, the CEO of White Goods Company Archelic, to find out how it's strengthening its green targets. I want to ask you about Archelic's specific sustainable commitments now. You're targeting net zero target throughout your value chain by 2050. How feasible is that? It's not, actually. <laughs> I mean, a straight answer. It's, it really is not. Uh, the laws of physics dictate that it's not. But what we can do is we can reduce our emissions and impact drastically. And once we manage to do that, then we, we can mitigate the rest by investing in regenerative or what we call blue carbon credits. In the end, we will have to invest in projects which mitigate whatever carbon uh, we are emitting. But uh, one thing is certain is that we have to do everything within our power to minimize that. And we will. This would also apply to scope three emissions, which takes into account 
business travel, investments, and even employee commuting, yeah. things traditionally that are not counted when it comes to sustainability reporting. What is Archlet doing specifically <laughs> to reduce those yeah, scope you're, three you're, emissions? You're basically asking me questions that are uh, uh, controversial, let's say, but I love answering them. And uh, I, sometimes I'm not very much liked in industry for these answers. Scope one and two emissions are only 2% of RTX emissions. So we're very proud. We pat ourselves on the back and we say we're carbon neutral. But in, in fact, the real impact can only be scope three emissions. And unfortunately, of the 200 businesses, largest businesses worldwide, only 40% even track and report their scope three emissions. You have to understand why. It's like a Pandora's box. It's human nature to avoid the, the, a problem that you don't have a solution for. But we're not going to win this if we have that attitude. We have to make commitments that we don't know how we're going to meet. We have to commit to investing in technology and innovation and set the bar so high that it may scare us, but we have to be brave and really attack it in a way that will make a difference. The company also launched Turkey's first ever corporate green bond on the international market. Why was this important and what did you do with the money raised? It's, uh, it's again uh, a way of kind of certifying uh, what you're doing. It's an outside recognition, independent recognition. And I've done a lot of M&A in my career. I can tell you the due diligence around a sustainability or a green link bond is much tougher than any M&A due diligence that uh, a team is going to go through. Because there's been a lot of greenwashing in the past. For us, issuing, it's a 500 million bond, which actually was very attractive rates, 200 base points below the sovereign debt rating of, uh, of Turkey. So um, uh, we're very proud of that bond. And, and of course, the proceeds go into projects which help us transform even faster. Of course, you're a publicly listed company. Are your shareholders becoming increasingly aware of sustainability efforts and do they hold you accountable for those? I think so. The position we hold as a leader in, in this is very visible to investors because we lead the Dow Jones Sustainability Index. We got an award like the Terra Carta seal. All of this is very visible vis-a-vis -vis the investors and investors are under a lot of pressure today to increase their allocation to sustainable businesses and to companies who are transforming. Um, so absolutely, yes. I mean, they are questioning, but they see us as kind of um, a leader in this field. And I think we are getting a lot more positive feedback from investors than in the past to keep this leadership. Of course, it's very difficult to hold on to something that you have as well. We'll see what the future will show. What about profit over purpose? How do you balance that? When you talk to my colleagues around the world, they are very aware of what we're doing around the environment and it has become the number one reason for them working with us. Uh, I'm very proud of that. In the past, you could have separated the two, purpose and profit, but today, if you don't have that purpose, you will lose the profit for sure. I really believe that this transformation is the only way for companies to survive the long term. Have there been instances though, that you've had to choose money yeah, yeah. over sustain? Of course, it's a business, so you know, capital is scarce, you have to allocate capital. I mean, if I had the choice years ago, every surface we had in the business would be solar panels. We're getting there, but it's taking a number of years. So, of course, there are trade-offs you have to make. The important thing is choosing the right ones with the highest impact first. What about your suppliers, Hakan, or even the governments and countries that you work in? If they don't match your own standards and your own values, how hard is that for you to keep that relationship? It's difficult. Um, I can't say everyone in the ecosystem sees eye to eye with what you're trying to do. Many people still don't understand the importance and the urgency. Uh, but I think as we select suppliers and reward suppliers for joining this transformation, we also give them the toolkit, by the way. So. We have a team that's available to them to consult, to help them along this journey. And we are clearly preferring suppliers who are transforming themselves. Have you ever had to end a race? Yes. Yes. Many instances. Okay. And it will continue because it's a natural selection process. If we have an alternative that's cleaner, we will go there. For example, packaging. I mean, the pandemic drove me absolutely crazy with the amount of online uh, ordering of packages. and you know, these piles and piles of piles of non-recyclable packaging. And I suddenly became more aware and we attacked our own packaging. We're eliminating EPS, uh, which is the styrofoam, you know, the, the soft boxes, which has no half-life, essentially. It'll take time, but suppliers that are not also following this path, we just change because this is the way we want to go. 
You touched on carbon pricing before. You are a delegate at the High Level Commission on Carbon Pricing and Competitiveness at the World Bank. Why is it so important? I think without a way to price the cost of the damage we're doing or the carbon we're emitting, it's very, very difficult to allocate that cost and create funds to actually mitigate it. The EU has set a wonderful example with the Green Deal. The Green Deal really is a good deal. It sets standards, it sets a trading mechanism, uh, and it sets a great example. The problem I have is that Europe can only be an example because it's 8% of emissions, and we're not going to make a dent in, in this fight if we only look at Europe. So this example needs to be followed elsewhere. The mechanism in Europe that is going to work is actually exactly that, a carbon pricing mechanism. Now, what is the problem? It's very, very volatile. But what you will find happening is as businesses realize that the financial future holds such a high risk in terms of the cost of carbon mitigation, today what is 50 might be 500, might be 2,000 in 10 years, and they might be regulated in terms of forced to buy the carbon then. It makes sense to accumulate that on your balance sheet today. And I think carbon pricing and the underlying infrastructure will help companies actually hedge the risk to their future in a way. Well, when I spoke to the head of the IMF, Kristalina Gorgiev, on a previous episode of Sustainable Future, she said she's pushing for an international commitment for carbon pricing. Is that achievable, do you think? I think it's achievable. I think the main framework is there. The floods in Germany, the fires on the Turkish coast, as these things intensify, and believe me, they will, people's will is going to harden and governments ultimately go by what their constituents are going to vote by. This is going to force change much, much faster and the f quickest way to make a dent is a integrated global carbon trading mechanism. And I'm glad that she's thinking about that at the IMF because it's the only way forward in my, in my opinion. Up next, climbing to the top. Everest, I thought, with all of its sort of magic allure, would help me get people to pay attention. Everest gives that little bit of magic ingredient. I am suffering, but also at the same time enjoying this challenge very, very much. And I really want you to believe that I'm doing it for the right reasons. According to the journal Scientific Reports, Himalayan glaciers have already lost almost 50% of their ice due to global warming. To help raise awareness on the effects of climate change, Archilic CEO Hakan Bergulu undertook one of the most physically challenging expeditions out there, climbing Mount Everest. and his team successfully reached the peak in May 2019. Hakan, I'm just going to ask about your experience now of climbing Mount Everest. We've just seen some footage of you doing that. You wanted to bring attention to the climate crisis and that's what you chose to do. <laughs> yes, I don't think it was very wise of me, but uh, I did choose that because um, I, I'm very passionate about sustainability, but Everest, I thought, with all of its sort of magic allure, uh, would help me get people to pay attention. Everest gives that little bit of magic ingredient. And, and when I speak about Everest, people don't realize it usually, but I'm feeding them sustainability facts. And uh, it was a difficult endeavor. The whole purpose was to raise awareness on the melting glaciers in the Himalayas. About two billion people in Asia depend on the water from the Himalayas, which is coming from the glaciers. 50% of these glaciers have melted, and the remaining 50%, depending on the expert you speak to, between 30 to 80 years are going to disappear. That means two billion people moving onto other people's land. The scale of conflict humanity has never seen before. And uh, I think this is just one of the impacts of the changing climate that I wanted to raise awareness. Was there ever a moment that you thought, oh, I'm not sure I'm going to make it to the summit? Several times. On the way up, I, I tried to <clears throat> change my mind on two occasions, uh, on the summit push. On both occasions, it was much more dangerous 
to actually return than to continue. Again, caused by the climate, there was a cyclone on, on Everest, not really seen, Cyclone Fanny, which reduced the weather window to two days, what is normally two weeks. I climbed the Tibetan side. It's more technical, colder, uh, harder, uh, but less people and more orderly. And then once I got to the top, a very euphoric moment, very quickly replaced by the fact that I needed to get down. <laughs> You've written a book about your experience, A Mountain to Climb. What is the message you want to give from that? Well, Mr. Sharma himself, who was uh, running COP, uh, inadvertently, when he was in the middle of negotiations, used the word, well, we still have a mountain to climb. And uh, uh, we were joking that I'd actually given him a book and he was quoting the title. The title I chose because literally the, the battle we face in terms of becoming more sustainable, humanity, and surviving as a race, I mean, I'll go that far, really depends on changing the way we behave. And it's a mountain to climb. And Everest for me was a challenge uh, beyond uh, my expectations. I really felt the importance to A, raise awareness as much as I can and devote my life to actually making change happen uh, in terms of a more sustainable world. And some of the reasons are selfish. I have young children. I want them to have a childhood and a life, a quality of life that I did. For our children's generation, and mine are young, it may be food security. It may be finding a roof over their heads. It may be a very different world. And I want to be able to look them in the eyes, you know, 10, 15 years later, and say, I did absolutely everything I possibly could. What were the values that your own parents instilled in you? Your father was the CEO of Koch Holdings. I believe as a teenager, you worked in the Grand Bazaar no, in, did, yes. in Istanbul. And at what point did climate change become such an important issue for you? Um, my parents always had me in nature. So we, you know, we always uh, holidayed together as a family and always in nature, always around the water. So I had a love of oceans from a very young age. And uh, I was born in Norway, lived there till I was five. So I was in the mountains. And then I could say my work discipline or approach to sort of never giving up comes from, of course, uh, my father being a very practical, street smart uh, businessman. But my concern around the environment and the climate started intensifying as I saw real change. The places that I was fishing uh, in my childhood and then selling the fish in the market from 54 species down to 12 species. I lived in Asia for a long time, in Hong Kong for 13 years, so just going around Asia, you could see the diminishing rainforest, losing the animals because their habitat were being destroyed. And one particular moment I will never forget, I took my children to experience this beautiful beach uh, that I write about in the book, uh, Maya Bay, and, and there, uh, you know, what I remember as being completely pristine clear water, coral, sea life everywhere, white sand beach, was, I took my kids there and we were knee deep in plastic, knee deep, decaying corpses of birds. And my daughter, who was four at the time, looked up to me and said, why? You know, why? And I couldn't answer. And that was a real moment for me of like, this has to stop. You know, this really has to stop. What is your hope for Archlick in the future with sustainability? I hope we remain the most sustainable uh, business there is, uh, and not just in our industry. I hope we're able to transform into a company which is completely decarbonized and maintains this higher purpose. So my hope for Archidic is that we'll be around in a very sustainable way, uh, completely net zero, even maybe carbon positive one day. And your own personal hopes? My own personal hope is, um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I couldn't answer why when my daughter said, why, what is this plastic, what is this trash? 10, 15 years later, when she's an adult and she says, so what did you do about it? I want to be able to say, I've done absolutely everything possible I could do. If I've done that, I've lived a fulfilling life. Hakan Bakulu, thank you so much for joining me on Sustainable Future. Thank you for having me. We've come to the end of the episode. For more, head to our website and search for CNBC Sustainable Future. I'm Tanya Bryer. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you.